Hello again everybody, welcome back to IndyCar 2.0 I say 2.0 in deference to the, the SNP's um, apparent support today for a thing called the Common Market 2.0 <coughs> Pardon me, 2.0 What's the Common Market? Why does it say 2.0? And what's it all about anyway? Well, it's all about this um, idea of having a new uh, arrangement with the European Union and originally when we joined the European Union, of course it wasn't called the European Union, it was called the Common Market in the UK and it was basically just that, the EEC it was officially called, the European Economic Community and it was set up as a trading block so that people could trade with each other without having to pay taxes to each other's governments on the goods that were traded and the idea was just to create uh, a level playing field so that all the countries of Europe were interdependent on one another uh, and could trade equally, and we joined that in 1973, uh, and that would have been fine, except that the European Union has grown since then, and there has been a political union, which we have signed up to through the Maastricht Treaty, and then the Lisbon Treaty, and then there was the Schengen Agreement, and there's this closer and closer union, and there's a social chapter, and so it goes on. The, the European Union project has grown like... Um, like a hospital, basically, with all sorts of bits and pieces added on to it, uh, to the point where it's unrecognisable from what it was before. And the idea here is that uh, if people can't stomach uh, staying in the European Union, at least the English people can't stomach it, we could give them something like they had back in 1973, which is uh, effectively the trading block all over again. It would be just the, the tariff-free trade. In other words, a, a customs union and a single market. Uh, but the SNP is backing this, apparently, from what I've read, anyway, just in the last five minutes. And all 35 SNP MPs are, are supposedly going to vote for this. And it also seems, and I'm saying, uh, it seems that the Labour Party is going to whip their members to vote for it as well. But uh, does it stand any chance of actually being actioned by the, the government at all? Because as far as we're aware that it is the stated intention of um, Theresa May's government, her administration, to keep forcing the, the Mrs May deal down everybody's throats until we eventually give up and vote for it, or we, we crash out of the European Union. So this, does this uh, EEC Mark II, this Common Market 2.0, have any chance at all of um, succeeding where all the other... Uh, Pardon, I've got let you here, where all the other suggestions have failed. Well, it's perhaps something that the Labour Party and perhaps something the SNP and even maybe the Greens could get behind. I don't know. Maybe the Lib Dems will get behind it. But would the Tories get behind it? That's the big question because it would mean uh, a return to sort of 1974 75 where we're doing business with Europe. And the European Union is gradually developing, but we are not part of any of the political union or the social union or any of the other bits of the union that affect uh, our daily lives in terms of things like laws and legislation uh, and human rights and things like that. Would it be enough? Well, according to the SNP, this is one. This is the sort of minimum standard that they would accept if we can't stop Brexit. Um, Joanna Cherry has said actually that she still thinks there's a chance that they can revoke um, Article 50. For, for my money, I think the problem with all of this is we're rather taking our eye off the ball here. We're being sucked down the rabbit hole into the whole Brexit uh, sort of malaise that has infected the rest of, of, of England and Wales. And as a result of that, we are... We're basically just being hoovered up into this big game. And the big game is basically, let's all talk about a lot of stuff that's never ever going to happen while Mrs May runs the clock down and at the end of the week we'll be faced with having to vote for a fourth time on exactly the same deal again. Because there's absolutely no guarantee that any of the stuff that is going to be voted on in the next few hours is actually going to make the slightest bit of difference to anything at all. And you have to ask yourself, is this a good use of our MPs' time in Westminster? Or would it be better, perhaps, if the SNP was concentrating a lot more on planning the next referendum to get us out of this mess? And do we even need a referendum at all? 
Now another thing that is cropped up today, again, and this thing keeps floating back up to the surface like like a turd in, in, in a pond. It is this new UK constitution that the Lords has, have apparently dreamt up uh, and it's been slowly processing through the House of Lords machinery um, in, in a very slow motion. But basically this is this um, hideous <laughs> new British constitution which would make Scotland a vassal state forever and would prevent us from ever having any referendums again on anything at all and all of the sovereignty would be vested in, in Westminster uh, and Scotland would no longer be a, a country and all this. It is basically just a load of total cobblers uh, and it has no chance, I don't think, of ever passing it into law in any way, shape or form because apart from anything else Britain doesn't want to have a constitution because Britain likes, I say Britain, what I really mean is London, the Westminster bubble, they like not having a constitution because it means they can make the rules up, which is what they're doing this week. And if they can't make the rules up, then it's very difficult for them uh, to keep foisting unwanted policies and unwanted laws and unwanted um, cuts on the rest of us. But this this thing has been floating around since 2015. That's when it first started to, to come to the surface. And I think it is just simply something to annoy uh, those of us who want to leave the, the United Kingdom. It's there just to provoke us. It's there as a spoiler. It's there to make you feel unsafe. And frankly, I don't think it has a cat in hell's chance of ever becoming a law or ever becoming a full-blown constitution because the British state doesn't want to have a constitution. Otherwise, they would have had a debate on this years ago. The Lords, well, they have to do something for the £300 a day. That's when they're awake, that is. And this is the best they could come up with, was some half-assed attempt to snatch power away from a next-door neighbour country with whom they have a treaty but over whom they have absolutely no control whatsoever. So it's rubbish, frankly, and I think you should just ignore it. Now, I don't always do two shows a day, but it occurred to me that something is missing at the moment from the, the, the Scottish Foreign Independence. We've got a constitution coming, right? We know that's there. We know it's at Holyrood. We know it's waiting to be actioned after we vote on independence. But there's another thing that bugs me, and that is that the independence offer that the SNP has been planning to make to us as, as the population of Scotland is based on a thing called the Growth Commission's report. And the Growth Commission was set up to examine the absolutely worst possible way that you could become an independent Scottish state. And the worst possible way would be to copy all of the Tory spending plans for Scotland and to pay all of the debts that we don't owe to England back and to accept the, the debts and the deficit that have been imposed upon us by the English state, which we don't really need to pay back, and lumber ourselves with this colossal debt that we have to pay back to England while still not being able to fully take advantage of things like our oil revenues and our, our gas and electrical supply and all the rest of it. So the, the Growth Commission report is, is actually an exercise in how you can make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. But actually that's not the way independence should be being planned. And we all know that it's not the way it should be getting planned. So the Growth Commission report was proof as if we needed it, that independence is possible even if you followed the worst case scenario, and even if you adopted all of the Tories' austerity policies, you could still have independence. Even if you didn't have any oil, not a single drop of oil, you could still be independent and pay all this debt to England, and you could still have a successful country. So it's proved to everybody, and hopefully it should shut up the Tories, that independence is possible even with their ridiculous restrictions placed on it. But what we don't have is a document which shows actually how you would really do this. How would you really become an independent state? What would you really offer the people of Scotland? And what would you base that offer on? And I'm thinking that what we need to look at is not the Growth Commission, but a Sustainability Commission, 
One of the things that's causing problems in the global economy at the moment is there is no growth left in the world economy because everybody and everything has already been exploited, which means there is no additional value to be added to anything. And therefore, inflation and prices and interest rates and lending rates cannot rise anymore. That's why we have zero interest rates virtually for the last 10 years, because nobody can make any extra value out of the world economy. It's flatlined. It's dead. Right? The capitalist explosion, which was based on growth, right, has stopped. Because if we have another growth spurt now, at this moment, it will tip the world over into a major global catastrophe. Because we would use up every resource that we have left. And the population explosion and the pollution explosion would kill the planet off. And the people in charge of planetary global economic management know that. But what we don't know is, or what we don't know is, what we can do about that. So Scotland has the opportunity here to start its own sustainability commission. And that should mean looking at how to build Scotland as a completely sustainable zero carbon economy without any growth. Now you heard me right, without any growth, without any profits, no profits. The idea is that if any surpluses are made, then they are reinvested into the businesses that are run in Scotland. And that most of the businesses in this new Scottish economy should be uh, in, basically they should be in the ownership of the people who are working in them. And the people who are working in them should be the ones who share any profits that are made or who decide to invest any profits that are made back into the business to secure their long-term future. Or, even better, to create more human jobs for more human beings. Because the way growth works is that if growth keeps working, then what will happen is more and more machines will do the work, more robots will take over, the human beings will have no jobs and no way to earn any money. So somebody would then have to tax the companies whose robots are making the stuff and then distribute that tax money which they've taken from those companies and give it back to the people who then need to buy the products. So you see where I'm going with this? The problem is that growth is finished, it's ended, it's over, the world has finished growing, the economy can't grow anymore. So we need to plan the Scottish economy based not on growth but on shrinking the number of our population and keeping the uh, amount of wealth in the country relatively stable so that with a slightly fewer numbers of people their quality of life will rise and at the same time because there's fewer of those people they have less of a footprint on the planet they produce less pollution uh, there's less sewage going into the sea or into our rivers there's less pollution coming from heating their homes there's less energy needed for their transportation their cars their ships their planes and so on. There are just too many people in the world. And I think somebody needs to say it. And somebody should really be Scotland. Because Scotland is a wee place, it has tremendous natural resources that it could be exploiting much more efficiently than it is. And its people could be living in relative comfort, if not, not exactly fantastic wealth, but very comfortably. Nobody should be poor in a country this size, especially not with things like oil and gas and wind and tide and water and whiskey and food and tourism and engineering and biomedical science uh, and banking sector industries. We've got so many things that we earn money from that there's absolutely no reason at all why uh, we cannot just keep our economy at exactly the same level it's at at the moment and simply just allow our population to decrease a little bit and not worry too much if we don't get too much immigration because we always worry that there won't be enough young people coming through to take the jobs to pay for the pensions of the people who are retiring. The problem is that doesn't work anymore because there are far more people retiring than there are young people to support them. So we need a different model to support the people who are retiring. Remember, a lot of these people might not need to retire now because if they're healthier and they're still 
active and fit at 65, 70, 75 years, they should be allowed the option of continuing to work, or even better, developing new businesses and creating new jobs for other young people and teaching them new skills. Stop the robotic exploitation of workers as well, because robots are fine and great and dandy and everything else, but why just build a robot just because you can? It makes profit for a very small number of people, and that very small number of people get wealthier and wealthier, and everyone else gets poorer, and the robots get nothing anyway because they're machines, right? So we need to decide in Scotland how many jobs are going to be done by machines and which high-skilled jobs we want to protect and which jobs human beings are going to do. And we need to make sure that the human beings have meaningful lives with creative, enjoyable, satisfying work that gives life meaning because at the end of the day, human beings' lives only have meaning from what they can achieve in their lifetimes. And if all you can achieve in your lifetime is sitting on a sofa watching Great British Bake Off and taking brew money, there's something wrong somewhere. So my vision for Scotland's future is one where we no longer are trying to grow the economy any bigger. We're not trying to generate billions of pounds. What we're trying to do is take the billions of pounds we already have, use it a lot more wisely, reduce our energy consumption to a peep, and not be so fussed about how many young people are being born, because we can't do that anymore. We don't have that luxury anymore. When you prolong the lifespan of your species, then that means at the other end of the life, at the beginning of it, there have to be fewer individuals being born because your herd of human beings cannot support uh, that number of non, sort of, what shall we say, non-active members of that herd of human beings. Those human beings have to be doing something uh, in order to make it worthwhile um, for the rest of that community. And we need to think about that. We need to stop avoiding the issue because I feel that the whole issue for the last 10 years has been completely avoided. All talk of population control is a taboo subject. And everybody's delighted when the birth rate goes up. Everybody thinks, that's wonderful, lots of new children coming along to support all the old people. It's not going to work. There's going to be far, far more old people than there are young people to support them. And anyway, why should the young people support the old people? The old people have made lots and lots of money throughout their lives. They should if they've made plenty of money, be able to support themselves in their retirements if they've invested it wisely. And if they haven't, and they're still active, well, then they should still be allowed to work. And there should be work for them to do. But we need to stop thinking of this as though we are still living in the 1950s. We're not. People are living routinely up till the 90s and hundreds now. That's quite normal. My, my own family, a lot of my family members made it into their mid-90s. And, and they were all born, you know, at the, at the beginning of the previous century. And if they were that healthy then, and they've got good genes, then those genes might be passed on to me and my kids. I might live till my 90s if I'm lucky, if nobody wipes me out on the road first. But my kids will probably live into their 90s too. And that means that if they retire at about 70, that means they've got maybe 20, 25 years of not doing anything um, what should we say, not doing anything active to earn their crust, earn some money, because they've retired. But they might not want to retire, and they might not even need to retire. But we need to look at reducing the number of new human beings that we are introducing into our population, because although those new kids are, are, are welcome, we need them to sustain our numbers. We don't need to grow our numbers anymore. That's what is wrong with the planet at the moment. Our numbers have grown too big. We're using too much energy. We're using too many materials. We're throwing away so much stuff that we really need to stop and learn how to reuse that stuff, how to remanufacture it and stop filling up holes in the ground with crap that we have just bought and used once. So we need to change our ways. All I'm seeing in this broadcast is I want to see a sustainability commission set up. I'd like to see the independence that we offer people, offering them something different, frankly, than more of the Tory austerity that we've seen from the Growth Commission. 
that shouldn't be necessary. All the oil wealth in the North Sea, right, we're not going to be burning that oil in the future. Quite simply, we can't afford to burn that oil in the future. Otherwise, we are going to cook the planet. So that oil will have to be used for something else. If it's brought out of the sea at all, it can be cracked and turned into all sorts of other things. It can be turned into gas, for example. It can be converted into useful polymers and plastics and solvents and phosphates and nitrates and things for fertilizing the fields. But again, we dare not use it too much because we're already polluting the sea with too many nitrates and phosphates which is causing algae to bloom in the sea and kill off the wildlife. We need to stop growing and we need to stop overusing things. And one of the worst things we ever did, actually, was discover and exploit oil. I know it sounds crazy to say that, but maybe it would be a good idea to leave the oil in the North Sea. Just leave it there and develop all the other new power industries that we've currently got. Offshore wind, offshore tide, combined wind and tide big solar, solar panels on every building, every single house to have solar panels by, say, the end of 2030. These kind of developments are the sort of thing that Scotland needs. Not more of the same, not more burning fuel, not more mass production of stuff that we throw away. We could lead the world in this, and I've no doubt that we will lead the world in this one day, but we need a plan to do it. And what the SNP has provided so far is just not that. What the SNP has provided so far is proof, if it were needed, that independence is possible even with the austere policies and the stupidity of the Tories' uh, normal method of doing things. But that's not how we're going to run the country, and it's not how it should be run. All of the um, utilities in Scotland should be publicly owned. Nobody should be paying thousands of pounds for their heating and lighting and electricity. We are being fleeced and gouged by massive... Uh, multinational corporations. Have you seen the size of the Scottish power building in Glasgow that was built recently? That building is where all your uh, profit went. All that m extra money that you paid for your electricity went into building that building and employing the thousands of people who sit in it every day counting the billions of pounds that are rolling in from us, paying far too much for the energy that we're producing. We need our energy production to be owned by the state and we need it to be under the control of some central authority like it used to be. Remember the good old days of the electricity board, the coal board, the gas board. These were publicly owned utilities. You knew where you were. You knew your gas, your electricity, your telephone bills were not going to skyrocket up. And the prices, the, the profits from those were not going to line the pockets of fat cat billionaires they were going to go into a better service. So those things should always have been publicly owned. Likewise, the railways, the bus service, the ferries, all of those things, public service, public sector, public transport. The only things I think that you could probably leave in private hands would be taxis and possibly airplanes, because those are best done by multinational corporations who've got deep pockets for the fuel bills that they entail. But apart from all of this, Scotland should be doing something completely different from the rest of the world. We should be the ones setting the example, not following Tory dogma like the Growth Commission suggests. Now, I might be coming across a little bit as an old socialist here, but I'm also a realist. And the realist in me says that the planet is going to tip over a cliff. And that cliff of climate chaos... Uh, and extreme weather conditions is going to cause starvation, it's going to cause crops to fail, millions of people are going to be killed by flooding and inundation and disease because of it, and we are doing nothing, nothing at all. I mean, this is not just an environmental catastrophe, this is a human catastrophe, and it's about to overtake everybody. It's already overtaking the animal kingdom. David Attenborough has showed you just how Almost every corner of the ocean now is polluted by human waste of one kind or another. It's not that, it's tampons, it's baby wipes, it's plastic bottles, it's plastic bags, it's fishing nets. It's every, every kind of crap that you can think of that human beings cannot be bothered to either reuse or dispose of. There are massive industries waiting to be created, which Scotland should be pioneering right now. 
and we're not seeing that leadership from our Scottish Government yet. I'd like to see that. Really, that's all I wanted to say to you today. Um, this is a personal viewpoint from me, not news, just my opinion. Uh, you might have similar opinions, you might have other ideas, but I think it's about time that the Scottish Government came out and said the Growth Commission report was a load of bollocks and we're going to throw it in the bin and produce something real now. And I'd like to see what it is. And I'd like to be on the board that decides what that should be because a, a lot of us, and not just me, a lot of people are sick to death of high prices for energy, pollution everywhere, single-use plastics everywhere, no control over it at all. Packaging everywhere, single pieces of fruit covered in cling film, it's not needed. It should be binned and banned right now. The Scottish Government could ban it if it wanted. They could just say every supermarket, every shop, no more unnecessary plastic wrapping on things like fruit and vegetables. Any trays or any containers that are made must be fully recyclable, but not only that, but the people who make the trays must be forced to recycle them. As soon as you start creating laws like that, you create new industries because the companies who make this crap need then to create new businesses to dispose of it. And this is how things change. At the moment, nobody is doing it, and I think really now is the time to start thinking about it. Because when we do vote for independence, the last thing we want to do is to vote for the same old shit again. The same old British crap, the same old American consumer crap. Let's leave it behind. Let's start fresh, a fresh sheet of paper, and let's design a country which doesn't run like that. It's not that hard to do. It can be done, it's already been done before in other places, and it can be done here. I'm almost certain that all we have to do is just say the words, become independent, and let's put it to a government and elect a government which promises to do these things. Because I, I've, I am absolutely sick of looking at mountains of rubbish wherever I go in this city of Glasgow. You stop at a traffic light, there's mountains of crap lying outside on the pavement, on the grass, in the bushes, in the trees. It's everywhere. It's filth, it's unnecessary, and it should stop. Run over. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.